You're listening to episode 92 of the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, I'm chatting with Kritika Agnani about how to get comfortable sharing your uncommon nutrition perspectives. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm your host, Laura Schoenfeld, a registered dietitian, nutrition business coach, and online entrepreneur with over 10 years of experience in online business. And I'm here to show you everything I've learned about creating a life and a business that nourishes you. On this podcast, we'll talk about the lifestyle habits, practical strategies, mindset shifts, and leaps of faith required to build a healthy body, a powerful mind, a strong spirit, and a successful business. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, your host as always. And today's conversation is definitely a little bit of an uncommon one because we started off talking about intentional weight loss and how that applies to the ideas around intuitive eating and health at every size. And we ended up finishing the conversation talking about content creation and being consistent, putting your message out there as a dietitian business owner. So it's definitely a little bit of a grab bag. And whether or not you're somebody who's interested in learning about weight loss, or if you're somebody who is running a nutrition business or wants to start a nutrition business and is feeling a little fearful around putting your content out there and being consistent with content creation, I think this conversation is going to be valuable for you. And honestly, the common thread between our entire conversation is this idea of being consistent with your efforts towards your goal and focusing more on actually implementing the habits as opposed to worrying so much about the exact outcome that you're getting. Because sometimes the things that you're putting effort into take a little bit of time, maybe they take months or even years before you really see the full benefit of the habits that you're forming. And that can apply to your weight loss goals as well as your goals to have a successful business. So I hope that you'll enjoy this conversation today. I think it's super valuable, especially if you're somebody who wants to get started with a big goal, but feels a little bit nervous about how to take action. So today's guest is Kritika Agnani. Kritika is a registered dietitian with a master of clinical nutrition degree and has experience in caring for patients, both in a hospital and one-on-one setting. Her specialties include weight loss and athletic performance. Kritika discovered her passion for educating after she taught the course Nutrition and Diet Therapy at Collin Community College. She then began to create educational YouTube videos to combat common nutrition myths and misconceptions. Her goal is to help people create a healthier, more connected relationship with food and to make quality nutrition education more accessible. In her free time, she enjoys weight training and playing piano. And like I said, one thing that really impressed me about Tika is that she is so committed to taking action, even when things are challenging, even if she's not seeing the immediate benefit, or even if she is a little bit nervous about putting herself out there. And so I hope that no matter where you are in your goal setting journey, that you'll find inspiration from our conversation today. So without further ado, here is my guest, Kritika Agnani. All right, everybody. Well, I am so excited to have with me on the Fed and Fearless podcast today, Kritika Agnani. Welcome to the podcast, Kritika, or I guess I'm calling you Tika since that is your nickname. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And we always love to start off with a little bit of like a get to know you kind of question so that our audience can get to meet you and and just get a sense for how you became a nutritionist and why this is something that you're passionate about. So tell us your story about how you became a registered dietitian. Yeah, it's always such a loaded question, right? With dietitians, it's like, how did it's a long story, but in short, when I was younger, I had a really bad body image. I had a very unhealthy relationship with food. It was around like the 90s and the 2000s where I feel like nutrition wasn't that mainstream yet. And I would read a lot of misinformation online about, well, just eat fruit and you know, you'll know, you look like this. And I would do those things and it was just not healthy. And through that, I became really interested in nutrition and like I went to get my bachelor's degree in nutrition and then I got my master's degree in nutrition because I was just so interested 
in it. And the more that I studied it in formal education, the more that I realized, oh my gosh, these things that I'm doing to my body, it's going to make it worse, not make it the way that I want to make it. And like having a healthy body and a healthy relationship with food, I'm doing it a disservice. So it was honestly through education that actually improved my relationship with food and my body image. And now I just really want to help people sift through that because there's so much misinformation online. And there's so many things where I feel like people will read something online and it just sounds so convincing that they can just fall for a lot of misinformation. And I feel like it's also not their fault because this misinformation is so rampant now and it's so convincing. So I just really, I'm here to help people sift through that and make sure they don't harm their bodies the way that I harmed my body when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear this term misinformation. I know that, you know, there's a lot of different directions we could go with that. I feel like there's, in my opinion, there's a difference between information that's just like bad and wrong. Like, oh, just eat fruit. And that's the only thing you should eat. Like clearly that's not good for anybody to just be eating fruit. And then there's more of that misinformation that's like, it's almost like it just wasn't customized or personalized to that individual. And so even though maybe it would be beneficial for somebody to follow that, that it wouldn't be beneficial to the person that's reading it. So when you talk about misinformation, what are you thinking about when you think about misinformation that people are seeing online? Oh, that's a good question. I guess I'm talking about like that extreme misinformation that's just like horrible for anyone. Like, you know, oh, you can detox your body by just drinking juice and do that for like a week or just fast, fast for days and days and days on end. And that's where I feel like, well, but I think there's a fine line too, because maybe there is a fine line between, okay, maybe some of this stuff can work for some people in a very like certain situations, but I feel like that's unethical really to be saying that online to vulnerable people that would just, you know, they're maybe in a very vulnerable state. Maybe they feel like I need to do anything that I can do to lose this weight and mm -hmm. they will follow anything. Mm -hmm. So, but then I also think that there's also a responsibility on the consumer to not always believe everything that they read online and not always think that everything is credible and that everything applies to them as well. Mm -hmm. So that's tough. Yeah. I feel like that's one of the biggest issues we have in the nutrition space today, especially with the way that there is so much information online because it makes sense that people would feel overwhelmed or feel like they're bouncing around between a lot of stuff because pretty much any diet approach that exists, I feel like you could find a pretty convincing argument for it online somewhere at this point. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so just being able to understand, first of all, what makes something credible versus not credible, and then also making that decision of even if this is credible for a certain type of person, maybe I'm not that type of person that would really benefit from this approach. So you and I connected earlier in this year, like around March or April or something. And it's on a topic that we've talked about on this podcast before. It's definitely one that I think continues to be pretty controversial in our space as dietitians. And that is this idea of is intentional weight loss ever okay? And I know that there's some pretty strong opinions on each side and strong mm -hmm. arguments and lots of potential evidence on both sides that both sides could be accurate. So I'm curious for you, because I know you've talked about this on your YouTube channel and on social media and all of that. What's your perspective on intentional weight loss? And do you think it can ever be healthy? I really have the perspective that yes, intentional weight loss can be healthy in certain situations, but I do understand where people are coming from when they say that, well, it can never be healthy. When I see people talk about this, just from what I've seen, I've seen like two groups of people. I've seen some people who say that, well, being in a larger body and having like a higher weight, it doesn't matter at all. And like weight doesn't matter at all as an indicator of health. You can be like this much weight and it's not going to influence your health. And then I see this other perspective where it's like the complete extreme opposite of that is that putting weight on this pedestal of this is the most important health indicator. And if you're in a larger body and you don't, you know, losing weight is the best thing that you can do in this larger body for your health. It's the number one most important thing for your health. These two extremes, I feel like my opinion falls somewhere in the middle. I don't a hundred percent agree with either perspective. And when it comes to intentional weight loss, I do believe that can be healthy for some people because 
I mean, I've seen studies. There was this one study um, that looked at the NHANES data from 2005 to 2013. I might be getting those dates wrong, but they looked at data for those who were uh, BMI normal all the way up to BMI obese class two and three. And what they found was that statistically, it's less likely that you are metabolically healthy. And when I say metabolically healthy, like not on any blood pressure medications, normal triglycerides, normal LDL, all of that stuff. They looked at all a lot of these different metabolic criteria. It's less likely that you are going to be metabolically healthy statistically if you are in that obese class two and three category. It was like something like 16% that was metabolically healthy. It wasn't 100% either way. It wasn't that those in larger bodies were all unhealthy. And it's like a correlation thing too. So like what came first? Mm -hmm. As far as intentional weight loss is concerned, there is the camp that would say it's always harmful. And I've seen arguments that are presented with evidence and, you know, well, that's what, you know, this research says and all of that, like all of the kind of like health at every size kind of research. And, And I think what you were saying a second ago about the evidence showing that there were some people in those higher weight classes that were healthy metabolically. Is it a lot? Sounds like no. Sounds like a relatively small percentage. Yeah, it was a smaller percentage the more that you got in that um, the larger body category. But it was also the other way around in an underweight category, statistically less likely to be metabolically healthy. And I think one aspect this might be coming from when people think that weight loss is never healthy is maybe because I hear a lot of people saying, well, there's no research. There's no research to show that there's a sustainable weight loss method that actually works for people to like keep their weight off. Yeah. There's no one diet. There's no one approach that it's like, this is going to be healthy for everyone. This is the answer to sustainable weight loss. And this is how you keep that weight loss off. There's no research on that. But from a research perspective, just because there's no research on something doesn't mean that that's a good or a bad thing. It doesn't mean that that's never the case or that's never possible. Just Mm -hmm. because there's no research doesn't mean it's not possible. It just Mm -hmm. means that there's no research right now. And I think one reason that there's no research right now is because every body is so different. Everyone has different genetics. Everyone has a different socioeconomic status. Everyone has a different lifestyle. There is not going to be one approach that's going to be best for everyone. And that's not I don't know if we're going to see that in research that like, oh, this is the diet. This is the weight. This is the healthiest habit, or this is the way to lose weight. And this is the answer, because I think that answer is going to be so different for everyone. And I've had clients who have come to me like wanting to lose weight. And I've had to like, there was a different approach for everyone. Everyone benefited from a different approach. So I think that's one reason I agree. I disagree with the statement that weight loss is always unhealthy. I think that's just a very blanket statement that it may be true for some people, but I have seen personally people who have benefited Mm -hmm. from weight loss with different approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like one of the things that makes weight loss hard to research is because they want to just focus on like one or two variables, right? It's like, let's do this diet approach and see how this works. And I'm sure you would agree, having worked with clients to help them lose weight, that it's rarely just going to be like one thing that you're doing that's helpful for somebody. And even if there was a diet strategy that worked for most people, there's so many things like psychology, environment, you know, habits, exercise routine, genetics, like micronutrient deficiencies, like there's so many different things that can play a role in somebody's ability to lose excess weight in a way that's not harmful, that the thought that they could ever create a controlled study that passes the kind of standard research criteria, right? Because like, I don't know how much you learned about this in your program that you got your dietitian degree from, but we did a lot of like research methodology stuff. I think that's a pretty standard thing that dietitians learn. But what I was going to say is just understanding how they even create these studies and realizing like, wow, this is not even actually the best way to study this. If you think about Mm -hmm. the difference between researching a very specific thing and actually seeing how it plays out in practice, I find that actually helping somebody in real life is so... I don't want to say messy, but it's like, you can't just put it into this tight little box that's like, we're going to study this one thing 
and, yep. you know, do these two different groups. And this is the only thing that we're changing. And, oh, look at that. Yeah. Like it didn't work. And so that's yeah. why with research, I'm not anti-research. I just feel Absolutely, like yeah. it is something that when we're working with human behavior, human, you know, habits, emotional health, physical health, all of the different things that go into somebody's results, it's like, how do you actually study something like that in a way that would count as traditional research? Yeah. Yeah. And I think research is so valuable for certain things. It's just that when it comes to weight loss, and like you said, when it comes to working with clients one-on-one, it's life is messy. Things are messy. They're dealing with so many different things that we can't just control and put in a box. And I think that like even that whole unintentional weight loss or intentional weight loss is always harmful. What if they're not really focusing on their weight? And what if they are daily just practicing healthy habits, like exercising, eating more fruits and vegetables. Maybe they're tracking their calories. Maybe they are meditating to relieve their stress and then they do lose weight. And um, maybe they were trying to lose weight, but they're doing all of those things, but they're not getting so, you know, they're not beating themselves up over it. They're not using weight as a number one indicator of their health, but they're doing all of these healthy things that are making them feel better. And then they're losing weight on top of that. I can't say that that's unhealthy. Yeah, I feel like I always correlate it to the idea of pursuing financial benefit, right? Like if you want to make more money, if you want to save more money, if you want to, you know, build your wealth, there are habits that you can implement. And, you know, there's probably some mindset shifts around money that you need to make some changes. You probably need to do some things that are unpleasant, like saying no to certain investments and like, you know, maybe cutting your spending a little bit, there's behavior changes that have to happen. And if somebody said that, you know, building wealth wasn't good for you because it causes you to like have to do all this stuff and deprive yourself and that kind of thing, I just feel like nobody would ever want to work towards that versus, you know, I think most people would argue that addressing your spending habits, addressing your earning habits, your mindset around wealth, all of that would actually be a really good thing. And, you know, if they were just going based on statistics and they said, oh, and I don't know the the actual numbers on this, but if it's like, you know, 60% of the American population is in significant debt or something, that wouldn't be a good reason to not work towards financial security, right? Like it wouldn't be like, oh, well, most people are in debt. So I probably shouldn't even bother, you know, working towards the financial security. I love that. Oh my gosh. That is the best analogy. I love that. We can't just ignore that at all because I know that there are people out there who want to lose weight. What if they, they intentionally want to lose weight and they're not going to listen to people that are saying that, oh, well, don't worry about that. Just love your body. Just accept your body. Let's not worry about weight. Sure. That I think that's a great message sometimes, but I also think that like, well, if someone is so set in that, and if someone feels really uncomfortable in their body, then why, why would we ignore that and push that away and just be like, well, just don't worry about that. Let's not talk about that. Yeah. I mean, there's so many studies that show even just a small percentage of weight loss can really help people that have a significant amount of weight to lose. Like I think it was for every 10 pounds of extra body fat that somebody loses, they take like 40 pounds off their joints. It's some like weird multiple like that. And you know, I've worked, and I'm sure you've had the same experience before where I've worked with people where, yeah, like maybe they didn't lose enough weight to be like a bathing suit model, right? Like that's not necessarily the goal, but even just losing a little bit of weight, getting a little bit of that extra weight off their joints was something that made a huge difference in how they felt, how they could move around. If they were able to be active with their families, if they're able to like get off the floor when they're playing with their kids or their grandkids. So I think sometimes, and this is my opinion and, and you can tell me how you feel. I think sometimes when we're thinking about intentional weight loss, people are always thinking about these like dramatic results as being the goal, as opposed to being okay with like a modest amount of weight loss that does actually positively impact their health. And Mm -hmm. when it comes to the body image piece, that's like a whole separate conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree because I think like, and and it's just that weight loss in itself has just become so taboo, whether it's because we don't think about like, oh, it's just, you know, losing a small, modest amount of weight to improve your health versus like losing like a hundred pounds or something or getting to this like stick figure level that unrealistic beauty standards that we don't need to be. And I think like, we don't really see that differentiation being made. We just see weight losses like, oh, this is kind of like a taboo subject now. Mm -hmm. 
So just to kind of go back to our conversation before about misinformation. So I know that you said that you've worked with a lot of people before who wanted to lose weight and wanted to get healthier and came to you with those goals and likely had a lot of misinformation that they were either believing or had experimented with. What are some of the more common beliefs that you see people coming to you with that are not accurate or maybe causing more harm than good to their health? Ooh, that's a good one. Let's see. There's so much misinformation that people believe, but then also I always try to look at the bigger picture and be like, okay, like how is this affecting them and what is this causing? I mean, I think one thing, this may be more subtle, but one thing that people that often believe that, well, fruits and vegetables, like I can't eat healthy. And I, they have this mental block of why they can't eat healthy because healthy eating means buying organic, buying natural foods, buying very expensive foods and not eating anything that's frozen or canned or in any of this processed state. And it has to be in the most unprocessed, most natural form to actually be healthy. And so that's such a mental block that people will just not eat fruits and vegetables and not eat imperfect foods, quote unquote, imperfect foods, because they believe that it has to be so perfect and they have to wash it in this vinegar bath and they have, it has to be freshly picked and all of that. And That's one thing I hear often that I think people would really benefit if we actually learned that no, organic doesn't necessarily mean healthier. And I think that it might be more subtle, but I think that's one thing that if we get rid of that mental block, that people would be more open to trying more nutritious foods. So do you find that people, if they can't get access to something that's like fresh, whole vegetable kind of thing, that they would just not eat vegetables because they don't think it's good to eat frozen or canned vegetables? Oh, yeah. I've heard people tell me that, okay, well, I'm not going to buy these carrots because the carrots are like um, cut up into like shredded carrots or they're baby carrots. I'm not going to buy, I'm not going to eat them because they're more processed. Oh, wow. That seems like, I don't know if I've ever heard that before. That just, I'm wondering where somebody would have learned that from. I don't know. I don't know. I see sometimes YouTube videos with misinformation on things like that, like just very, very strict, like it has to be this way. And this is like the healthiest way. And like you have to spend tons of money on healthy foods. So mm-hmm. I've seen it. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure one could argue from a environmental perspective that the least amount of processing would maybe be beneficial if we could generally move in that direction, right? Like if there's a lot of industrial involvement to produce the food, then maybe that's not how we should have our entire diets, right? Like, you know, maybe there's yeah. there, it's good to have some stuff that's minimally processed. But I feel like if your choice is eat the processed vegetable or don't eat any vegetables, I don't know why people would be pushed into that. Like, well, I might as well not eat them at all if I can't get this like perfect, like pulled straight from the ground carrot. So it's almost like that all or nothing mentality that I also see a lot with like, when it comes to cravings and stuff, like people will be like, well, I already messed up my diet. I already had like a bunch of pizza. I might as well just have ice cream and all this other stuff. I think it comes from that kind of all or nothing. Like it can't be in the middle. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because I feel like one of the things that I see works really well with people's health habits in general, let alone like a weight loss goal is allowing things to be just talking about effectiveness rather than good and bad. So is it effective to eat a lot of pizza and ice cream if the goal is to get healthier and lose weight? Probably not. Like that's, you know, realistically, logically, probably not going to be the most effective way to do it. But is the most effective way to just eat, you know, like I said, carrots and kale pulled straight out of the ground and there's no processing? Probably not either because first of all, that sounds gross. Like if that was all you're eating all the time, like that would feel probably pretty depriving. And there is that concept of like the 80-20 rule where 20% of your effort will give you 80% of the results. And it's like, so if you think you need to do 100% effort to get results, then that's going to feel a lot less attainable or possible than if you're like, well, what's 20% that I could do? Maybe 20% is just, you know, not having ice cream every single day, maybe having it once a week yeah. or having a slice of pizza and a salad rather than half the pizza. Like those kind of smaller, less sexy choices that people can make would allow them to actually be successful because they don't feel like they have to do this super extreme approach that really isn't something that they can stick with. 
Yeah. And I think we're so attracted to like extremes and we're so attracted to like quick results and we want a quick fix. And so we might not even gravitate towards that or see that as an option. It has to be, you know, all or nothing. It has to be like, we have to do it a hundred percent perfectly. And I think that is a huge mental block too, because a little bit every day can really, it can compound and just help a lot more than doing like, you know, a fast for three days and then just like binging on food. Right. Yeah. I feel like the challenge is people don't really want to hear that their goals might take a few years to reach. Unfortunately, and it's the same thing. I mean, I do business coaching now and it's even the same thing with growing a business. It's like people want to have the like 12 weeks to a six figure business kind of thing. And having been in business for, gosh, this is year eight, you realize like, oh, it really does take time for this stuff to actually like build on itself. And like you said, compound and the stuff that you're doing, you're not necessarily going to see the result that week or that month or even that year. Like it might be a step that you took that then is is really showing the result in a year or two years from now. So I feel like with weight loss, it's the same thing. You have to make changes that you can actually maintain for the long term. And they're usually not the kind of changes that are going to show really significant results very quickly. And I feel like the big challenge that most people run into is how do you stay motivated when you're not seeing like biggest loser level progress? Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm actually working on a YouTube short right now on motivation and how I really think one of the keys is learning to enjoy the process of your healthy habits. Like when it comes to exercise, not feeling motivated to exercise, well, finding exercise that you actually really love and that you enjoy and that you look forward to, then motivation may not seem like such a hard battle anymore as if you're actually going to look forward to it and you actually enjoy it. And I think that's another mental block because people sometimes will see exercise as something that they have to do and that they're forced to do to look a certain way or to have this kind of health. But if we're able to like look for the little joys and find the little joy and like, what are the foods that I actually really love to eat that are super nutritious? What are the exercises I love to do? What is like a nighttime routine that I would love to follow that I would look forward to then maybe motivation. And maybe that's just one small part of motivation. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And I I saw in your bio that you like weightlifting as a, a form of exercise, which I do too. And it's something that I've really noticed. I've been working with a trainer doing like pretty traditional powerlifting and bodybuilding kind of stuff. Not, I'm not about a body lifter. Like I, I do not a body lifter, a a bodybuilder, not a body lifter either. Um, same thing. Like that's not, those are not my goals. I'm not competing in powerlifting. I'm not like getting Mm -hmm. on a stage for a bodybuilding or something, but the workouts that we do are kind of the traditional like strength training, like some, you know, hit kind of stuff. And something that I've noticed because I've been doing it, gosh, I think this is six years now that I've been working with this coach. Wow. We've gotten to a place where like, yeah, I have goals and yeah, it's like fun to like PR stuff and that kind of thing. But I've been doing it long enough that it's no longer about there being some kind of like specific outcome goal with weight loss or the strength ability or anything like that. It's almost more as someone who wants to improve performance across the board in my life, whether that's my business, my health, anything, I look at something like weightlifting as there's like a certain level of doing it that actually creates overall benefit in my life. So when I think about my exercise routine, I'm not going to lie. Like I don't always want to lift weights. Like I I enjoy it, but it's not like something that I wake up in the morning. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to like get out (laughs) to the garage and start doing this like powerlifting stuff. It's sometimes I am kind of not like I'd rather just like lay around and read a book. But my feeling is I actually can see the immediate benefit in my energy and how I feel and like just overall, like my ability to move around in my day-to-day life and be my ability to do things that require some level of strength. That is very directly impacted by whether or not I'm consistently working out. And even last year with all the COVID stuff, when all the gyms shut down and everything, and I couldn't work out for six weeks, I noticed that it really made me feel less good to not be able to work out. And so I'm at a place, maybe it's just that I've been doing it long enough, but I'm at a place where it's like, I'm more focused on just the actual action. Like, did I check that off my week for the week where it's like, did I lift three times this week? Yep. Checked it off. Like that ability to say that I did it is actually the goal as opposed to 
there being like some kind of fitness goal that I have or, you know, a weight loss goal or something like that. And it's interesting because I used to be so like when I was in my early 20s, this is dating me a little bit because that was like over 10 years ago. Um, when I was in my early 20s and everything was about, I want to look a certain way. I want to have like abs. I want to like lose weight. And now that I'm in my mid 30s, it's kind of like, I just want to feel good and I want to make my machine. Like if I think about my body and my brain and everything as a machine, I just want to make it function as well as possible. And even if I don't always enjoy every single workout that I do, I know that that consistency of working out is actually contributing to the performance of my machine, right? And so it is one of these things where it's like, I almost feel like you go through these levels of motivation where your first motivation is like, I want to look a certain way. And then your next motivation is, well, I want to get strong. And then your next motivation is, well, I just want to like operate at a high level in my life. And I don't know if there's going to be another stage after that, but that's kind of been my experience. Yeah. It's so interesting because it really does like once you, I think once you have an exercise routine, you realize that, wow, it translates to other areas of my life. Like I'm more focused at work or whatever it may be. And I think that's a huge part of motivation too, is like realizing that and realizing how you feel after your workouts and how this is affecting your life and your day. And that can be a huge motivator. And I feel like it applies to food too. Like I know for me, if I start to get a little, I, I don't want to use the word lazy because it's, it's, I don't really like to use those kind of words. But if I think about just not paying attention to my food or not prioritizing it, I do notice that it makes a big difference in how I feel, whether that's like my energy, my mood stability, that kind of thing. And so it's another one of those areas where it's like, yeah, it'd be easier to not have to worry about eating vegetables or, you know, not thinking about how much protein I'm getting in that kind of thing. But if I'm not thinking about it, if I just ignore it and just eat whatever, it does make a pretty significant impact on my ability to function at a high level during the day and during the week. So it's one of those things where, you know, it is really more about like, is there a significant benefit to the way that I'm able to live my life on a day-to-day basis if I'm doing these habits consistently? Because it's not like one day of eating vegetables is going to be like, a huge, oh my gosh, my brain is functioning so well now. It's more just like the consistency over time. And I feel like, like what we were saying before about that not really being the sexiest thing. Like, oh, if you're Mm -hmm. really consistent for six years in your strength training, like you're going to feel great. It's like, that doesn't sound as attractive to people as lose, you know, 50 pounds in three months kind of thing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So now I'm going to totally go on another tangent because I know that you have a YouTube channel that is growing and I was watching some of the videos before we jumped on today to just kind of get some ideas about what to talk about. And I'm always really impressed when people are able to commit to content creation on a regular basis. It's something that a lot of my nutrition entrepreneur clients, like they struggle with it. It's not easy to consistently put out content and to, Mm -hmm. you know, be doing that on a regular basis. Again, we're kind of talking about this like consistency of habits being the goal here for, and this applies to business too. Yeah, definitely. So I would love to hear from you. What's your vision for this YouTube channel? Like what do you hope to accomplish with the videos that you're putting out? You know, I think my main goal is like going back to the misinformation is to really like be a voice, a credible voice in this nutrition, health and wellness space to help people understand nutrition a little bit better and to understand like there is misinformation online and to sift through that and to get the right information. I think I'm just so passionate about spreading the evidence-based information and the right information so that people don't harm their bodies and do what I did when I was a kid. And I just really want to be like an advocate for healthy nutrition and health in general. So that is one of my main goals is just to spread the right information and help people like not harm their bodies. Mm -hmm. So what tips would you have for somebody who is interested in starting a YouTube channel for their business? Oh man. Well, so I'm, I'm also just starting. Um, I have maybe 40 videos or that's so. That's a lot. But that's, that's great. Is it? Yeah. I mean, most people, most people, I, I feel like I heard a stat once and this is more about podcasting, but I think I heard the average person quits after like six episodes of a podcast. Yeah. So I can imagine YouTube videos would be similar as far as like people's stick to Oh 
Oh my gosh. It's so tough with the editing and everything. Like it takes days sometimes to film and edit. And then sometimes you throw it away because it's not as good. And I think one thing that might have held me back in the beginning was trying to be so perfect and trying to, you know, get everything out so perfectly. And I would film again and again, and then I would get down on myself or upset with myself if it wasn't perfect. And then it would prevent me from uploading. And we know that consistency is the most important thing on a YouTube channel, as is probably most things in life. And I think that's the most important thing is to that you can get started right away with just your phone. Like all you need is your phone and an internet connection. And you're good. Like you can make YouTube videos if that's something that you really want to do. But I think like also asking yourself, why is it that you want to do that? And really having a solid why, your why power, why do you want to create YouTube videos? And it can't be for the money because you don't make a lot of money on YouTube. I've been watching a lot of like the YouTube creators talk about how you make, typically it's different for everyone, but one-tenth of a penny for every view, one-tenth of a penny for every view. And that it's going to vary based on your niche, but YouTube itself is not going to be a form of um, income for you that's going to sustain you. So it's really about like, why are you doing it? Why do you want to create a YouTube channel? Do you want to create a business around that? And um, having multiple streams of income and not relying on that because I've been on YouTube for, I think like a little over a year now and I'm not monetized yet. I think it'll probably take another year for me to be monetized. But yeah, having a solid reason about why you want to create it. And if you do, and if you have a strong reason, and if you want to create your own business and all of that and go down that route, committing to one video a week and not worrying so much about perfection, but just putting that content out because your videos are probably going to suck in the beginning, but eventually as you practice, because it's all practice and that's how you're going to get better. And as you practice and you keep putting content out, you keep editing, you realize little things, you keep improving on little, little things, your videos are going to get better if you just continue and commit to it. Yeah. I mean, I even think with podcasting, this is well, we're going to be in like the high, like eighties or nineties. I think we're in the nineties now for your episode. And I used to have another podcast that we did that I think we got up to like 200 something episodes. So, you know, just looking back over the course of eight years doing 300 something podcast interviews or or Ah, episodes, it's like, and I, I still don't always feel like I'm the best at podcasting, right? And so, you know, just those reps that you're getting in with creating content is so important. And I totally agree with you. Like just knowing that your first couple of times or maybe your first 50 times, maybe your first 100 times, it's probably not going to be that great. And you might look back a few years later and be like, ooh, cringy. Like I can't believe that's how I was doing my videos or that's how I was doing my (laughs) podcast. And it is a big barrier for a lot of people that are, whether they're in a nutrition business or a different type of business, like putting out content on a regular basis and just being able to commit to doing it and being okay with it being mediocre, not great in the beginning. And just knowing that you're building a skill that's going to get better over time. And just that consistency of showing up and doing them is doing way, way more for your business than if you were trying to make everything perfect and doing it like once a month or something like that. And I think maybe a lot of people are afraid of being judged, which is understandable, but I did, there was this one quote And it just changed my life. It said, if you're afraid of being criticized, do nothing, say nothing and be nothing. Just don't put yourself out online. Just like lock yourself in a room and just do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. Do you have something to say that's important? And do you want to put it out in the world? And there's always going to be people that judge you. And I still struggle with this, but it's really good to know that like you're going to be judged no matter what. So why not just put your opinions out there, put everything out there. And maybe you're going to be helping a lot of people. And you can tell me if you feel this way, because this is something I hear from a lot of my clients. Do you feel like the fear of criticism is coming from the fear of being criticized by peers in our industry? Oh, I don't, you know, I've never actually thought of that. And I've never experienced that, that, no, I've never experienced that kind of criticism. Or do you think there are people that feel that way? Well, I'm just curious because even with our conversation today, you know, we were talking about something kind of controversial that there could probably be a lot of dietitians and nutrition experts out there that would strongly disagree with what we were talking about. And I know that a lot of the clients I've worked with, no matter what topic they cover, whether they are in the intuitive eating space or they do more of like the medical nutrition therapy stuff, like any of that, a lot of times when they think about who they're really worried is going to come after them, criticizing them, it is other dietitians and other nutrition professionals. And I didn't know if you've had that experience or if it's more like 
And I am not insinuating that you're, you know, fearful because it sounds like you're, even if you were a little nervous about criticism, you're taking action, which is amazing. But if there was any sort of concern about being criticized, if you've ever thought about like, who are you concerned might criticize you? Is it just the people that you actually are there to serve? Or is it the people that are actually not competitors, but people in your space or in the nutrition field that maybe you're worried are going to call you out? You know, it's actually for me, it's actually, I'm afraid of that somebody's going to take something that I said in the wrong way and harm their bodies or spread more misinformation or something like that. Like, that's what I'm most afraid of. That's why I'm like, oh my gosh, everything has to be so perfect and all of that. I never thought of it as like dietitian or, you know, other health professionals disagreeing with me because I think like, I think it's great. I think it's great to disagree. I think that opens up a lot of conversation and that opens up people's minds. And I love having those conversations, especially with health professionals who have such a strong background um, in health and medicine and all that. I love to disagree and talk about our different point of views on that. And I feel very strongly in my belief that like, you know, this whole weight thing, it falls somewhere in the middle, but that's just my opinion based on what I've seen. So I'm always open to hearing other people's opinions and ideas. And even if they disagree, I think, I think it's great to, to follow people that you agree with and also follow people that you disagree with. Yeah. So that's just my stance though. Yeah. Well, it's interesting just because like I said, I've heard with this whole content creation thing, there are some people who are so nervous that other nutritionists are going to be like criticizing them. So for oh. you, it sounds like more of a concern that you want to, you want to do the right thing for people. You want to yeah. help people. And I want to show people the research and the evidence. And like, this is what this says, like, and this is how I'm interpreting it. How, what do you think? And having a conversation about that. Yeah. Well, and something that I always appreciated from my mentors that I learned a lot of the nutrition business building from is this idea of being just willing to correct errors. As long as you're willing to say you made a mistake and say that something yeah. was, was inaccurate or something, it's like, just that willingness to admit if you did do something wrong can really take a lot of that fear away because it's like, hey, like I'm not perfect. You know, this field is actually relatively a new field of science. So yep. it's changing all the time. There's stuff that we believe 10 years ago that we no longer believe and it's okay yeah. to change your mind about stuff. And so for me, it's always kind of saying, okay, I'm going to do my best to give good quality information and to be open-minded and to share what I feel is helpful for people. And if in a few years from now, I realize, oh, crap, like that wasn't accurate, I just am very committed to coming back and admitting that error and correcting it. So that's how I look at it is, you know, everybody's going to be wrong at some point, right? Like there's nobody in the world that gets it right 100% of the time or even probably, you know, the majority of the time. And just knowing that if you have that integrity to come back and tell people when you did make a mistake that that I feel like is more of a sign of being trustworthy than you never making a mistake. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. I think maybe some people are afraid of that, but nutrition, like you said, is such an evolving field. We haven't studied it for as long as we study something like chemistry. If things are going to change, we're going to learn new things. Science is always evolving. So agree hundred percent. Awesome. Well, Kritika, it's been really amazing to chat with you and to hear all about your philosophy on not only weight loss, but also on just putting yourself out there and, and creating content and being able to just overcome the fear of criticism or the fear of being wrong to be able to commit to that video creation. Because again, it is something where just the act of doing it is so beneficial, even if you know you look back in a few years and you're like, oh, that wasn't the best video. So <laughs> I applaud you for um, taking action on those. And so if, if people want to check out the content that you're creating and see your videos, where should they go to find more from you? Uh, you guys can go to YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. I'm on all three, and that's in the order of which I'm most active. Um, so I create YouTube videos every week, and then I'm posting on my Instagram stories and everything regularly as well. And then I just recently started a TikTok, which has been pretty fun. So I was saying to Tika before we started, I still to this day have not ever downloaded TikTok. I've never seen TikTok, like other than yeah. when people repost it to Instagram. And I don't know, maybe I'm just like, I'm, I'm an elder millennial or something. I oh my just gosh, like, can't get into so it. I'm, 
I'm 30 and people kept telling me, you need to get on TikTok. You need to get on TikTok. I'm, I'm 30. I'm like, I don't think I can keep up with this. I don't know how to use it. But then people kept telling me and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to watch the content because I feel like I could be sucked into it. I'm just going to create. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. Well, that's really, I like that philosophy and that would go for pretty much any content creation is like stop consuming all the content and just start creating <laughs> your own. And so it sounds like TikTok could be a really great option for people who want to reach more clients and maybe yes. just have a little fun with their marketing Absolutely. and messaging. So, yep, yep. <laughs> um, and all of those are under the name Uncommon RD, correct? Correct. Yep. And how did you come up with the name for that? Oh my gosh. It took a while because at first I was peas in a pod. I don't know why I wanted to change. I wanted to change it because I wanted to include like RD or dietitian and I wanted to include something like uncommon or, or something unique, because I know that I, I have like opinions that many people might not agree with. And I have like, I don't know, I feel like I went through a different nutrition path than a lot of people. So I just wanted to put like something, I don't know, uncommon or unique or something unique RD, I think was taken. So I took uncommon RD. Yeah. Well, I love that you've baked into your brand, this idea of doing things a little bit differently. Cause Again, I see so many nutrition professionals that get locked into this idea that they like have to do it the way everybody else is doing it to be successful. And I honestly end up teaching the opposite. I'm like, you should really emphasize your uniqueness and what sets you apart and what, you know, kind of controversial opinions you have and all of that. And I feel like that's much more effective for somebody growing their business than trying to just like make everybody happy and have no opinions right. and just like do everything right. quote unquote perfectly, which doesn't exist. That's such great advice. I love that. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kritika. And thank we'll make you. sure we put your links in the show notes if people want to check you out. And thanks to all of you for hanging out with us for the past 45 minutes or so. We'll look forward to seeing you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Hey there, Laura here again. Are you a nutritionist or dietitian struggling to figure out how much to charge for your programs and services? Maybe you've heard that as a nutritionist, you should just charge what you're worth. But this way of thinking can cause you to either undercharge your clients or work yourself into the ground trying to earn your worth. As a healthcare provider, you can't set up a pricing structure that forces you to sacrifice your own health and well being in the name of your business and your clients but I promise it doesn't have to be this way. When you download my free profit planning workbook, I'll walk you step-by-step -step through the 10-step process for determining the right pricing for your nutrition business. As a nutritionist, you have the power to completely change someone's life for the better. There's huge value in that. So it's time to stop underselling what you do. By following along with this worksheet, you can determine exactly what you need to charge to achieve your revenue goals with ease. I'll teach you everything I've learned about pricing from growing my own nutrition business to over $250,000 in revenue annually and helping other dietitian and nutrition entrepreneurs hit their first 10 to $30,000 months and beyond. To get your free workbook, go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, and grab your copy today. So you no longer have to wonder how to set the right rates for your incredibly valuable nutrition services. That's lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash profit. It's time to make the money that you deserve as a nutritionist, and I can't wait to help you get there.